from the advocate point of view, uh, planner working within a city, you know, obviously I'm advocating. In fact, it's my director that has this uh, kind of analogy, but he's like, sometimes when you're working with people, if you just yell at them and calm down, whatever, you know, they just shut down. They're not going to listen to you. So people that I work with, they're good people. They want to do the right thing. Uh, have they learned a lot of this stuff that I have? Maybe not. But uh, we kind of have to share and help them along the way and see, you know, if this is something they can get on board with. So, so it's kind of like the, the analogy is it's like taffy. Um, you have to kind of slowly stretch it out and, and then it'll get going. But once you get going, you can pull it pretty quick and it'll stay intact. But you try to do it real quick, sometimes you just break it and then things shut down. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. My name is John Summerman, and this is a very special episode with Mike West uh, from Daybreak in South Jordan, Utah. Uh, and he also is a planner for the city of Lehigh, Utah. Uh, this is a very long video because we're like nerding out on all sorts of Dutch bicycle infrastructure and well as the work that he's doing right there uh, in Utah. So we're gonna just jump right into it with Mike. Mike West, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Yeah, it's so great to be here. I'm honored to be on the podcast with you. So, Mike, uh, I love having my guests just to say a few words about themselves. Uh, who is Mike West? Yeah, so I'm a city planner. Been a city planner for 12 years now here in Utah. I uh, work for Lehigh City. Um, I've uh, really got into city planning, honestly, as a kid. When I was a kid, I would uh, play with Legos and create little cities and skyscrapers and things like that out of uh, lego so ever since i was four or five years old i started doing that so i really really started there as a yeah and a, here's an example of a <laughs> lego city i built which unfortunately at the time i didn't know any better i put a giant freeway right through the center of it but, <laughs> but uh yeah built some compact kids, cities i tell LEGO. you kids <laughs> these days <laughs> yeah <laughs> and uh Started there, I used whatever I could to, to build cities. In this case, I had little bottle caps and stuff that set out. Every little brick was a building and I'd lay out these big cities. So ever since I was five, six years old, I was doing this. So I was just, for some reason, I just really loved cities and just really interested me. Um, as I grew a little older and became a teenager, I always kind of liked cities and a lot of it kind of went back to, I just thought skyscrapers were so cool too. And like seeing these cool, big, dense cities in New York City, all this kind of stuff. Uh, but once I became a teenager, a little bit of a troublemaker, but I got really into cars, so I became a bit of a car enthusiast, honestly. <laughs> so I had this kind of these years, and it kind of bled out, but I even, uh, you know, when I was in my 20s, you know, I'd go out and rent fun cars. I thought it was just so cool. You know, I don't know if you could have honestly found a bigger car enthusiast than me at the time, which is kind of weird considering what I advocate for now, but... It's kind of like you've, I've seen that perspective and had that mindset at one point and now I can kind of see and transform to where I'm at now. So it definitely, uh, in my opinion, it helps uh, to know where I've been and where I'm going. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's interesting too is, you know, that concept, I'm glad you kind of brought that up from like a car enthusiast you know, perspective. Because in fact, I've had Ethan Tufts on who is a car enthusiast who has like an entire channel about cars. And, and he kind of had this revelation that as a car enthusiast, it's actually better for him because he loves to drive, but, but he hates, you know, the gridlock of, of car dependency and he hates car dependency. And so he's a car you know, enthusiast that, you know, kind of, you know, realized that, you know, being able to have choice, mobility choice, and being able to get around in other ways is hugely helpful to people who love driving cars. Uh, and I know that you have a, um, a, 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 a car enthusiast days, uh, you know, a video here so what's the story behind this yeah yeah for a few years in a row i'd rent a fun car for my birthday every year and this was me actually driving a lamborghini <laughs> getting on the freeway there so yeah <laughs> you know, at the time i thought it was the coolest thing ever but uh yeah just like you said it's uh sometimes to make driving better you have to give options for other modes so that's one thing i really stood out to me when i visited the netherlands last year but it's like uh in fact, they've been rated often as being one of the best places to drive. because Exactly. Has... I was just going to say, yeah, I mean, because of their 
mobility balance, in, in other words, being able to have, uh, you know, mobility choice, uh, they have been oftentimes ranked as one of the most satisfying places to be able to drive uh, as a motorist. So people who have to drive or really much prefer to drive, they're able to get around uh, quite easily, relatively speaking. And they're, they're, I think Waze is the, the organization that did the satisfaction and, and the Dutch turned out to be at the highest levels of satisfaction. Um, yeah. But uh, uh, these two look like uh, they're pretty satisfied too. What's going on here? Yeah, so uh, as I kind of was going along, obviously me going into a career as a city planner really started making me think things differently. I've loved cities all along, but understanding how everything works together in a city, you know, uh, so a few years back, uh, I think about six years ago is now, I moved to Daybreak, the master plan community in the southwest Salt Lake County, just south of Salt Lake City. And uh, that really changed a lot for me because all of a sudden I live in this house, right? There's trails everywhere. There's, I think there are 40, 50 miles of trails now in the, in, within daybreak. Um, so that, to me, that was just so much different. I can hop on my bike and I can ride over to the little shopping center. Now there's a grocery store and it was game changer. So, and because of that, as you see in this picture here, I was actually able to convince my wife to get a cargo bike. At first she was a little hesitant, like, well, I don't know, it's a lot of money. <laughs> but then I had a good friend of mine. He, uh, said, hey, borrow my cargo bike, see what everybody thinks. And as soon as she rode it, she fell in love. So, you know, in the 2020, as the pandemic was coming on, we're like, let's get this cargo bike. So anyway, we got this cargo bike here and it's, it's my son there on the right. He has special needs, but his favorite thing is just to ride in the cargo bike, as you can see on his face there. And uh, just the joy it brings to him. And he was even in a car enthusiast with me for a little while because he likes what dad likes. But, <laughs> but getting in this bike just was such a different story for him. He felt like he could get out in the community. And so getting this bike was just game changer for our family and living in a community that actually made it possible to safely get out and enjoy uh, riding. So I've learned a lot from living in Daybreak and seeing uh, kind of a lot of lessons learned from that for other communities to emulate yeah, yeah. as well. You know what, let's, let's actually, uh, you know, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, the city where you're working, you've also mentioned where you're living there in daybreak. So let's pull, pull up an overhead uh, view of what we're talking about and where we're talking about, since we are, you know, really broadcasting this out to an international audience. And so folks are joining from all over the place. Uh, so if we take, a, you know, take a look at uh, where we're talking about here. We've got Daybreak right here sort of outlined. We can see towards the east uh, where most of the de development is happening. And then it looks like we hit towards the west, we've got a bunch of undeveloped area. Uh, I know that there's like 1,300 acres that are going to be developed in the, in the near future. Uh, but then if we pull out, we can see down below where this star is, that's where you work there at the city of Lehigh. And then if we really pull back a little bit, we can actually see sort of the, the entire, um, you know, area here. And then we see Salt Lake City right up there to the north. And so you're, you know, you're pretty much down, you know, in the southern area of the Salt Lake City metro area. And for folks who might be uh, familiar with BYU University and Provo, we've had, pro we've featured some folks from Provo before that's down to the south here and south and east a little bit. So yeah, that's kind of the, the bearings as, as to where it's at. Uh, and that's what, 15, 16, 17 miles between the two, uh, Lehigh and, and Daybreak? Yeah, yeah, about 17 miles, I think, between okay. between the two, I guess, is the you travel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you mentioned city planning. And so are you, uh, you know, sort of a, a generalist in, in terms of the work that you're doing, or are you specifically looking at uh, transportation planning? Yeah, so I was, you know, I went to the University of Utah, got my urban planning degree. I started out kind of generalist. You know, here's the general things you should be doing as a city planner, dealing with zoning, um, general planning principles, things like that. Uh, but I really did get into transportation, especially the last, you know, four or five years and really learning a lot about it, uh, trying to create equitable uh, transportation uh, for everybody. Right. Uh, so I've, I've kind of, in my own way, taken my, you know, created a kind of specialized in transportation, I guess you could say. Yeah, I'm not necessarily a degree in it, but I've learned a lot and I really try to push uh, 
uh, different tra- transportation solutions now at work. Right. Okay. All right. Fantastic. And uh, you had mentioned that, you know, being in Daybreak, uh, and I'm going to just pull up a kind of a, the, the daybreakutah.com website here. Uh, we, it's, it's definitely, it's a, it's a master planned community. It's a very large master plan community. It is a Peter Calthorpe uh, designed community originally. And uh, I know that it's been going through different phases of developing, uh, as we saw from that overhead, we've got some of it to the east that's already uh, built out, and then much of it is, is unbuilt at this point. How many years has it been in development and being built out? Yeah, I believe the first phase is, and again, I'm not the planner for daybreak, so don't hold me. Right. <laughs> Do yeah, my yeah. Own. But I believe it uh, started around 2003, 2004 with construction. The planning work began before that. So they're about 20 years into it as far as construction goes. Uh, they, got a, they got a ways to go. That their original plan called out for 20,000 housing units, uh, obviously of all different types. So you've got apartments and a lot of the missing middle housing, which is really nice to see happening there. Of course, uh, quite a bit of single family. It is a suburban community, but um, I don't like to pigeonhole and say things are either suburban or urban. There's a lot of ways that can take form. And I think that's what's so important about Daybreak compared to typical suburban community you might see around here. And really what they're trying to get at right now is they're starting to develop what they call their downtown. So right. they have a the bees baseball team that's up in Salt Lake's moving out to Daybreak. You know, there might be good or bad. <laughs> Uh, as part of that, there's been a little bit of uh, opinions on both sides here locally, but uh, so they've got uh, this baseball stadium, they got some mixed use development going around that. So they're really trying to create kind of a center, an urban center uh, around the, the tracks line. Tracks is our light rail system that comes down oh, into wow. daybreak. Let's, let's see if we can get this on, on screen here. Uh, so whereabouts is the, uh, the, the tracks line? Yeah, so if you see, uh, in fact, you can see where it says uh, daybreak library on that bottom left hand corner. Oh, okay. There's those yeah. little blue icons right there. That's uh, one of the track stations. Ah, fabulous. Fabulous. So there's two track stations now. There's that one and one to the north, and they're going to put a new one in in the middle, which would be kind of the heart of their downtown area where that baseball stadium will go. Right, right. And what I, what, what's really amazing, too, just kind of looking at this, is there's there's a certain amount of water feature to it. You've got the, yeah. the water that's in here. And to, to your point of what you had said is that moving to ba- daybreak kind of influenced you, you know, as, as a planner yeah. <laughs> and as, also as a uh, uh, as somebody who is is passionate about this work, you know, so much so that you also, you know, got a, a cargo bike is, in fact, this network of trails that you had mentioned. And you can just see them popping out in green. So I obviously have the the bike network um filter uh, or layer filter turned on on Google Maps here so that green just pops right out uh, of all the trails that are in place. Yeah, and that's the thing that's uh, so nice about what they've done here. So uh, again, thinking to the Netherlands and what places like Houghton have tried to do, you create this park-like setting that you go along. Um, so it really creates, yeah, an enjoyable environment. Yeah, so when you're taking your family, it's a very enjoyable place to be and ride. You're around trees and greenery and Buildings are fronting up to these spaces, so it's a lot more engaging, a lot more eyes on the street. So a lot of these elements come together to really create an environment that people want to get out. So you're kind of enticing people to get out and walk and ride bikes. Um, at the beginning of my planning career, you know, I've you know, we're taught in school and you think about it. Yeah, planning for bikes is good. Walkability is great. That's something that we you know, tend to try and think about. But what it truly takes to get people to get out and ride bikes and walk places uh, is so important. So it, and the way we kind of create this built environment is profound effects on people's decisions and behaviors. Um, so when I first started planning, I'd put little painted bike lanes on cross sections and think, yeah, we're getting a bike network in. But when you realize what it actually feels like to ride in a bike lane next to high speed traffic, it doesn't really do much. But as you can see in the pictures here, like this bike rack at the grocery store, this is when it was a little bit busier, but I think I counted something like 25 bikes and scooters all there. So, and uh, unfortunately a little less use in the winter time. I think people are still trying to get used to the winter cycling thing. And, and to be fair, the paths and daybreak until about last year weren't plowed. So it's a little difficult difficult to get out of the bike. Uh, but you can see how many more people are embracing uh, cycling and walking the community. This is a bike parade that they did last year on the 4th of July. 
got a lot more cargo bikes we're seeing around daybreak. So to me, that's a sign of, you know, people are, you know, it sounds expensive when you say, oh, you know, get $5,000 for a cargo bike. Uh, compared to a car, obviously, it's pretty cheap. But when people are doing an additional purpose purchase, that sounds like a lot of money. Um, but when you start seeing those come out in the community, then you know that you're, you're doing something right. This picture here is just to show, and, it, and even if you go back to the Google, but here you can see these two people, you know, they look out of place on this road. So this is what we call strode, you know, as strong towns as coin, you know, this mix of a street and a road. You know, that to me is not a comfortable or an attractive place to ride a bike. Um, so that's to me the one issue with daybreak and honestly with a lot of just suburban areas around the United States is sometimes if there is a bike facility that looks like this, just striping, this really doesn't convince too many people to want to do it. So this was actually kind of uh, uh, not usual to see two people, especially, you know, casual riders riding in a, a bike lane like that. So I snapped a picture real quick, but um, yeah, once you leave daybreak, it's, I've kind of thought of it as a bit of an oasis for being able to walk and bike more safely, surrounded by kind of more of this auto-centric uh, development pattern. So this is kind of what you see when you get outside of it, unfortunately. But. Yeah. Yeah. And as you mentioned, you're you're not <laughs> working for that city and that area. Yeah. <laughs> now, is Daybreak yeah. a, a part of a um, municipal city? What, what city is it part of? Yeah. Yeah. South Jordan, Utah. So Daybreak is kind of the whole western half of the community and they have the eastern half. Traditionally, it was a bit more of a rural community. They have a lot of larger lots in the other parts of the city. Uh, yeah, I can't remember, 70s or 80s, it really started to develop more housing okay. um, and really started uh, growing quite a bit. So you had mentioned a, a little bit there uh, about the, the influence, too, and the comparison of Daybreak to um, you know, some of the, the, the Dutch cities, you mentioned Houghton, uh, for instance, and I, I having been to Houghton, I also would agree that, you know, it's, it's like one of those places where, um, and if we look at this overhead, you, you see like a similarity, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like, yeah. I mean, seriously, you, you've got the, you've got this water, you've got the, the pathways that are right along in through this green area. Um, for those people who, uh, have not watched my, my Houghton videos, I do encourage you to, 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 you know, click on those. I have a couple different ones. I've, I've ridden from Utrecht over to Houghton and then through Houghton, but I also have an interview with a local resident who lives in Houghton, went out of her way to move there because of the quality of life of being able to live in a city which was a intentionally planned city in the 1970s and started building in the 1980s um, where most residents actually do own cars, but cars are not permitted to um, to drive through the center of the city. All of the parking is in in, in sort of the outskirts and, and uh, it, it's just really a, a wonderful approach towards creating a people-centered design from a planning perspective. The, the one thing I love, and I think we got a couple of images and videos here, is the way they've done the traffic circulation plan. And that's one of the most important things, honestly, cities can get right. Getting protected bike lanes and all this stuff are obviously going to be a big part of the overall plan. But getting the roads right is one of the most important things you can do. So this image or this video here shows you the bike path is direct. So from these Kind of suburban areas a lot of more of your single family and uh, townhome type development leads straight up into where the transit station and kind of what we would call here in the u.s transit oriented development uh, so you got your shopping center and everything in the middle so you make it very convenient and direct and enjoyable uh, from the perspective of walking or biking uh, but then this image here shows your driving route so instead of this direct straight uh, option for cycling you have a bit more of a circuitous route it's not to say you can't drive. You absolutely can. So, and they have some parking there that you can use. They really incentivize you to uh, ride your bike or walk. But the difference here between where I live in Daybreak, Daybreak, it's just as direct to drive most places as it is to ride. So when the convenience factor comes into play, a lot, a lot more people may just say, well, I'll just take the car this time. Just going to be a little quicker, whether it really is or not. People perceive it to be that way or the infrastructure is dangerous and people don't want to ride their bikes on sidewalks or those painted bike lanes. Yeah, here you can see the, the getting to that city center, you don't have massive big roadways either because so many more people are walking and biking to get there. 
again, you can connect there and you can get there by car. It's a very free flow drive. So you're not like in congestion. Not that they don't have congestion in Lutherect and some of those places, but it's quite pleasant if you are going to drive, but it takes longer. So you're incentivized to get there faster on your bike, but you can get to the shopping center. There's a lot, the traffic there is not like this huge thoroughfare uh, traffic movement. So it's a very enjoyable place to be. Um, so that's uh, why it's so critical to get that uh, circulation plan right for a lot of cities. Uh, and Houghton is a, just such a great example. Oh, so okay. that actually is a good example because let's, let's you have these videos here real quick. Yeah. yeah. You've got all family, you know, family friendly, all ages and abilities paths throughout the community. So you get this type of environment. And then if you go to the next video, it, and you got the kids going to school there. But because you have those kinds of situations you've created, you also, you first of all, have smaller roads. So that's a lot less infrastructure you have to build, which on the cost side of things is a lot uh, better for a city financially. But also you have uh, a lot more free flow traffic situations. So when you do drive, you know, this was at the tail end of the peak hour uh, when we we're uh, doing this drive here. And uh, in this particular part of the ring road, it was uh, flowing really nice and smooth. Yeah, it's it, it is very very interesting when you when you take a look at um, you know that that Houghton example because of course Houghton was developed as being um, a, a community that could be a commuter community a bedroom community for Utrecht because Utrecht was getting rather full and the cost of of living in Utrecht was getting up there and so even way back in the nineteen sixties and nineteen seventies that was their vision for for Houghton. Yeah. And you see similar things happening in U.S. cities, you know, uh, for the case of North Utah County, we have a city, Eagle Mountain, Saratoga Springs. It's a similar thing. People move out there because housing is a little cheaper. The difference here is uh, Houghton has that direct transit line. You can take the freeway to Utrecht if you want. You have a direct transit line and they make it as easy as possible to cycle there and park your bike and then take the train to work. Uh, because it's a convenient option for people to use, then... Uh, that takes a lot of burden off of your roadways and other things like that. But that's something that's not an option. It wasn't designed in a lot of American communities. Yeah. 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 This shows, uh, that's me and my director. We came, when we went to the Netherlands last year, we just wanted it. We've done a lot of research, watched a lot of videos, saw some of your videos. Obviously there's a lot of content out there. That's uh, great to look at, but we're like, we just got to get out there and see it ourselves, <laughs> see what it's all about. So yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. So you had mentioned and referenced the, the Houghton circulation. So that's this image here. Uh, talk through this. Yeah. Yeah. So that blue line is the transit line. It's very direct up into Utrecht, into the central station. And the two dots there are the two locations where they have uh, train stations in Houghton. So the first ring to the north was the first ring built, and then they expanded to the south, that second ring. But those yellow lines are kind of their distributor kind of road network. Uh, so that's so what they do is the, the center where you have your shopping areas and where people are coming and going to the train station, they've done it in such a way that they don't circulate the traffic through it, they circulate around it. So they keep that through traffic as far away from that as, as you can, and you put it towards the, the outside of the development. And then towards the inside, you make it as easy as possible and pleasant for walking and biking. So that's why this traffic circulation is so important. So if you were to take a road right through the center of that, first of all, you'd have more congestion issues. It would be a place that's not quite as uh, pleasant to go to or ride your bike to. So it uh, really kind of works against a lot of the goals you may have as a city to, to having a good urban center. Yeah. One of the things I want to point out too, um, and thank you very much for this overhead, is the what you see here on the outskirts. So if you look to the north and you look go over here, um, you know, to the east, you'll see all of this farmland. And that's part of the point is that they have, you know, preserved so much of this rich farmland in this area. And, uh, and I absolutely uh, love this area too, because A, when I visited Houghton, I just jumped on my bike and rode from, from Utrecht into Houghton. Um, and so you're able to pass through a whole bunch of farmland. And then as I rode through Houghton and then went back out into the farmland, and then I looped back around and went back up to, uh, up, up to Utrecht. And it was just, it, it was so wonderful to see that really good transect, you know, that dividing line of, you know, this is where the urban development is. And then boom, 
we're going to keep this rural, we're going to keep this agricultural. And, uh, and, and in many cases, there was even, you know, cycle paths or, you know, very, very quiet country roads that you could ride on um, in, in that environment. And it's just, you know, such a, a delightful thing to be able to do. Yeah. And I think that points to some of the trade-offs we deal with, with a lot of the planning of kind of our American communities is, you know, people have moved to the suburbs with the idea of a yard and having kind of this breathing room. Uh, but the trade-off is, is you kind of build over all of your land. So you may have your own little yard, but then you have, you know, endless miles of uh, development. But the way the places like Houghton do that, you have this access to get out of those areas. Yeah, they're more compact, but you have access to get out easily and have, you know, respite, quiet, you know, you can get out and really enjoy uh, getting out on your bike and, and getting out in the countryside. Yeah. Well, let's pop back on over here. We, we've got some more um, uh, images. Uh, so we've got this image of, of you guys uh, making your way down some stairs here uh, with yeah. your uh, Ove Feats uh, bikes. So you've got, yeah. your, uh, you've got your rental bikes there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, I will give a shout out to Paul with the Dutch way. He was... He's been my mentor uh, about, especially with a lot of the way the the Dutch plan and do engineering and everything. It's just been amazing to as much as I've learned from that, I could never repay for. Uh, but he took us around for a week in the Netherlands. We, you know, I think we cycled like 300 miles while we were there, and we, you know, he used his car. We got to drive some of the roads, so you got to see from all perspectives and really understand how it all comes together in the big picture. Um, and and uh, even show us here's some of the greatest things that have been done, and here's some places where still not working well. So even, you know, things aren't perfect in the Netherlands. What I say is they're always, you know, they're, you know, 30, 40 years ahead of us, I guess, with the, at least for the cities that are trying to change. Um, they've just been doing it longer. So it just gives us a lot of you know, inspiration as to what we can do here. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Uh, yeah, definitely a big shout out to, to Paul with the Dutch way. And folks, if you aren't already subscribed to his YouTube channel, uh, make sure you do that as well. He's got some nice content out there. And uh, we've got a little bit of a roundout about action. What's going on with this? This was to show that not everything in the Netherlands is perfect or is what we'd like it to be because you got these big slip lanes on the roundabout. So this is in uh, Rheinsburg. Uh, so there's you know, sometimes people, I guess, almost fantasize about, oh, the Netherlands is perfect. I'm like, it's not always perfect. So it was a caution to some people. It's like, there's some situations you don't want to emulate <laughs> back at home. But uh, their new standards and a lot of stuff they do, obviously, are super awesome. Uh, I just like to point that out. This doesn't look like the Netherlands anymore. <laughs> <laughs> this was kind of a follow-up to the Houghton discussion. Because the driving situation is direct and you have this big wide road that is a little bit more hostile to you if you're out of a car, this is what I, you have to deal with to get to the major shopping center next to daybreak and traffic gets backed up quite often. So, you know, by making it easy to drive, or at least you think you're making it easy to drive in the end of the day, you're going to make it worse. So that's why you really have to create those options and think about. Or this. Yeah. <laughs> and this is the other end of the spectrum when you make it direct and easy to ride your bike or walk. Even when it's raining outside, not to say everybody here is enjoying the rain, but because it's the easier option, you you do it and it makes the city a better place by not having, you know, five to seven lanes of traffic cutting right through the city center here, which, you know, they've Utrecht's done a lot of work with trying to uh, restore the canals and things uh, right there by the central station. So um, it's amazing to see where they have gone and now where they're uh, uh, changing things back to what they once were before. Yeah. I like this video, too, because A, it, it emphasizes the fact that, yes, as humans, we we don't melt uh, or dissolve in, <laughs> in rain. Uh, you just keep riding. And uh, the other aspect of this is is right at the beginning of this video, you see that there's a motor vehicle there that's uh, waiting to, to get through. And then you also see a de delivery vehicle, uh, you know, delivering some items. It's it's not like the Netherlands are anti-car. Um, yeah. There are plenty of motor vehicles there. It's just that they have really strived to create an environment where there's a little bit more balance in terms of mobility modes. What I would say is they understand traffic management really well. So some, sometimes when you get thinking of traffic engineering, it's like, how many cars can we get through here? How can we prove the level of service? They think in terms of almost traffic management. It's like, yes, yeah, some people are going to drive, but there's certain areas where we want to disincentivize it uh, for other purposes. So. 
Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. And uh, the Crow uh, organization is, is sort of their mobility organization that they have there. And there's many different Crow manuals. Uh, the Crow manual that is specifically for the bicycle network uh, includes these five uh, principles for successful bike network. Why don't you walk through these and talk about the relevance, uh, you know, for you in the work that you're doing within your own city and within your own profession? Yeah. So since learning about this, is actually DTV Consultants out of the Netherlands there that uh, uh, prepared the last Crow manual. Uh, but we took a training course as our city staff, me and all the other planners here in Lehigh. Um, we took a training course on these five principles. We want to really learn, like, how do you truly create a more successful bike network? Um, so we, we've learned a lot. So uh, I guess just to run through them real quick, you got uh, cohesion. So that's uh, the idea of cohesion is you can get from anywhere to everywhere by bike. Uh, so it really gets at a connected network and you have to have, you know, uh, a dense enough spacing of your primary bike network to make it make sense. Um, then there's this idea of the directness principle. So that's really getting at convenience. Uh, so you want to, in fact, they have even a ratio that they recommend, uh, but you want to get there as direct as possible, both on the network level, but even down on the street level, you know, even getting through intersections and things like that. Uh, safety, obviously, I think that makes a lot of sense to people. You want it to be safe, both perceived and actual safety are important. And oftentimes that means putting your main bike route off of the main road. So as it's been coined before, the disentangling your modal networks. So you don't always want your main networks for your different modes on the same corridors. Um, but also safety is, you know, you have a lot of traffic next to you, getting a lot of those exhaust fumes and stress and stuff like that going on. So that really uh, disincentivizes people to want to go. Attractiveness can be subjective, but generally speaking, you know, if you're creating places with greenery, or like in the picture there, going through a tunnel with artwork on it. So it doesn't feel like this dingy, dark place. It feels a little bit more enjoyable so that I can make it so people uh, are enticed to ride their bikes. Um, then also the comfort principle, uh, really that's getting after you want smooth riding surfaces. You don't want weird, sharp angles. Uh, you want to be able to continuously cycle. So if you're having to stop all the time, that's going to really take a lot more exertion and um, really reduce the comfort of using facilities. So you want cycling to be as continuous as possible. And that really ties into the whole comfort principle. So what we're trying to do is with these five principles, we're actually updating our bike and pedestrian plan, trying to take it to the next level as much as we can, just obviously working with buy-in from all the other city staff and our elected officials. But we want to take these five principles and really bake it into the plan um, as best as we can um, and really allow that to guide the future of, of the plan and how we design it and where we put the network. So it's going to be, and we've already taken steps to do that, some of the projects we've done in the past, but also really what we're looking to do what we're proposing now and what we're looking to do in the future. Yeah. Um, in, in going back to uh, this graphic here on comfort, one of the things that I think about too is I'll, I'll linger on that. I'm sorry. Um, is actually when you, when we look at, you know, one of the things that they do very, very well, I think in the Netherlands is that recognizing that, Riding a bike is also a, so, a social activity. Oftentimes people are, are riding together, you know, maybe two friends riding together or a parent and a child riding together. And so part of the comfort thing is also making sure that the facilities are wide enough that two people can be riding side by side and still have enough room for somebody to, to be able to get around. And so I think that that's another part of that comfort thing. Yeah, that could bleed over into the safety as well as having a, a thing. But I think there what's really, really important to uh, acknowledge about these five you know key principles here is just how essential they are to actually getting a network designed. We're not talking about just one facility being safe and, and comfortable and attractive. We're, we're looking at the fact that this is really honing in on what it means to create an entire network versus just a facility. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. I and mean, that's a great point too. And when we're looking at our uh, bike lanes, if we can try and getting seven foot for width on a one way, uh, I think Crow Manual now calls for eight foot uh, for a one way so you can comfortably cycle side by side and sometimes even allow passing. Um, so all those, all those features are certainly critical to get that right. And, and this is a, a video of, of Davis. Yeah. So also went to Davis last year, uh, 
Wasatch Front Regional Council. It's one of our regional planning organizations here in Utah. They uh, organized this trip and got with the city of Davis and some of their planners and said, hey, you should come out to Davis, see how this kind of works in an American context uh, and show that things are possible here in the United States as well if you're doing a lot of these, uh, really trying to incorporate these principles. So they've done a great job of looking at directness and convenience and making comfortable paths. Uh, in this case here, you can see um, they even have bike roundabouts, which in some ways is not always completely necessary <laughs> yeah. for traffic management, I guess, but they're, you know, they're kind of fun to ride around. But even on some of their roads with the maybe not quite as ideal bike lanes, they're just more the painted ones, they still get a pretty good amount of use, but it shows what's possible, which I think is really important. Sometimes there's so many rationalizations out there why it won't work in your town, you know. Oh, it's snows here. If we're not Europe, we got hills. But you can point to places all over the place that have those same issues, and you can see it's successful when you really create the environment and the uh, the network that really supports and encourages use. Yeah, and this, of course, is a, a video of approaching the the Delft uh, train station, uh, and yeah. This is just one of my favorite places in the world. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I loved it. It really stood out to us again with the whole, you know, convenience and directness. You know, when you can combine uh, transit and biking together, that bike, bike transit combo, it's just amazing how much uh, use you can get. And that's what I love about that Delft station is you can just roll right in and, and uh, park your bike, which we're trying to work with the. Uh, the transit agency here, Utah Transit Authority, try to start thinking about how we do that kind of similar thing with a lot of our major rail stations. Right. So we we know that uh, the U.S. Department of Transportation and the F uh, the the uh, Federal Highway Administration is trying. They're trying to get stuff moving forward. Talk a little bit about this in the benchmarking program. Yeah. So I've been looking out to a lot of research, both uh, here at home, which sometimes is helpful when we're talking to engineers and others here, uh, but also looking elsewhere. But yeah, what I really like to see is that FHWA is also looking over to the Netherlands and they took a trip over there with some of their staff, I think it was back in 2015. Uh, and they really wanted to see the way they deal with their bike infrastructure, but also traffic management and the way that they approach safety. So since that trip, I've been seeing a lot more guidance coming out from FHWA, especially with the adoption of the safe systems approach uh, back in uh, fall of 2022. We're starting to see a lot more guidance coming out that really uh, lends, us to, lends itself to what the Netherlands and the Dutch have been doing. Uh, like they've now produced a guide on turbo roundabouts, which is uh, kind of a, an invention of the Dutch uh, for style of roundabout. Now we're starting to see they have a bike guide and they're incorporating, they, they have the five design principles they've added to, which uh, kind of build onto that. Um, and they even have a speed management guide now too, which includes what safe speeds are for given the context and things like that. So I just think it's huge to show people here at home in the United States. You know, I sometimes I'm looking out at the Netherlands a lot and I, I love a lot of what they do there. Uh, but when I bring it back home and say, hey, look, we should be doing this. Well, you know, our manuals say, you know, METCD says that doesn't work or whatever. So, but uh, to see the FHWA is taking steps and looking to the Netherlands for guidance, I think is huge. Yeah. So you just mentioned the safe systems approach. So we've got the uh, FHWA graphic here for the safe systems approach. Yeah. So this is what uh, FHWA has adopted. Uh, it's uh, safe systems approach is just like the Dutch have done sustainable safety, Vision Zero in uh, Sweden, which has now been adopted in several uh, cities and states here in the United States. But the FHWA has now adopted it for uh, the national transportation uh, approach. And really, there's these six principles and five elements. And once you truly understand what all these means, it, it, uh, it changes the paradigm in the way we structure our transportation system. Um, and it's so important to to get it right and understand what they mean. And this is actually something I'm really uh, trying to advocate for, both as uh, personal advocating, but also as a professional. We have around the circle or the principles, things like humans make mistakes. And when you understand that humans make mistakes, both on purpose or uh, inadvertently, then that changes the way you design and approach your transportation network. When you have things, you know, the other principle on here, humans are vulnerable. So... Uh, and I'm actually going to kind of do a hopefully a funny little video as part of my next YouTube video on this, <laughs> just to kind of illustrate the vulnerabilities. You know, at a certain point, our bodies just can't take much more impact. When you're in a car, you're a little bit more protected, so you can handle a little bit higher uh, or harder hit from another vehicle. 
But when you're outside of a car, uh, obviously you just don't have that protection. So understanding these vulnerabilities uh, and all the context around a road is so important to get to get right and understand how to truly increase safety uh, within our cities. Some of these other things, you know, death serious injuries, unacceptable. Obviously, that's you know, hopefully self-explanatory. But <laughs> uh, there's uh, some who maybe feel out there that uh, you know maybe just a part of the way things are, but we have to ensure people can have mobility, but I don't believe it has to be that way. And that's what FHWA is taking on the approach here is it is unacceptable. We can do better. We can just structure the system in a way to reduce and ultimately work towards the goal of zero fatalities. Redundancy is crucial and that's where the elements come into play in the middle. Um, safety is proactive, so we're not responding to issues. So we want to get ahead of it. We and. That's what we'll get to a little bit later here on here is I've got uh, several analyses I've done for uh, my work here at the city um, and really trying to help others around the state and the region, hopefully other parts of the country, how to approach a, a systematic analysis of your uh, transportation network. Um, so it's really getting out, understanding where the risk potential is and obviously prioritize and it'll take time to update your uh, system uh, every time you rebuild a road or build a new road. Here on the bottom, responsibility is shared. That's really important to understand as well, because a lot of people will just say, oh, yep, you got to follow the speed limit. You have to be responsible. But then that kind of goes against humans make mistakes. So we have to understand humans make, mis humans make mistakes. So when you're looking at responsibility is shared, FHWA has actually come out and clarified what they mean behind that. It means those who structure the transportation system need to be held accountable. Because when you blame the individual users, then there's no reason to update your system. Say, oh, yep, that person should have used a crosswalk. Too bad. You know, maybe everybody else needs to learn to use the crosswalk. But you don't understand, you know, the way humans interact within their environment. Environment, And again, humans make mistakes. So you have to anticipate that and structure the system in such a way that you're providing the right kind of forgiveness within your design. You know, obviously, if it's a highway, you have your high-speed design forgiveness. And then the slow-speed forgiveness, which really we don't do very well in uh, the general... In, generally in the United States, uh, really getting that right in a, in a more complex situation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you, uh, you know, clarified too that they issued a clarification of what they meant by that because unfortunately way too many DOTs, you know, out there when they say respons responsibility is shared, they lean into the victim blaming and really put way more quote unquote responsibility on, you know, quote unquote, those, those more vulnerable people out there in our uh, roadways that aren't wearing jackets of automobiles uh, and saying, you need to, you know, look out. And it's like, uh, yeah, well, you know, it, it's a very, very unbalanced amount of responsibility when you consider yeah. who causes the damage. <laughs> so it's, yeah. but it, yeah. And, and really emphasizing the fact that it's so important for us to make sure that we get the system designed properly. And that's what's really encouraging about um, at the federal level, being serious about taking a safer systems approach to it so that we can hopefully take, be honest about looking at the strodes that we have created and the tolerances for high speed traffic in areas that should not be high speed. We need to be, you know, honest and transparent and really, you know, start to, to work to uh, do better at that. So, yeah. Yeah. So in, uh, when looking at uh, the safe systems, there's the, in the elements, there's safe speeds. So that's uh, what this chart and the other chart for, from sustainable safety really get at. So based on some of the research, this is the FHWA speed management guide for safe systems, where this comes from. They list different types of crashes and what the safe speed is. They're saying this, these speeds you know, correspond to 10% risk of injury. So pedestrian at about 20 miles per hour, 10% risk for fatality. So there's even still some risk with that. But that should be the target. So if you've got uh, pedestrians or uh, even cyclists crossing uh, roadways, that should be your target speed. And we'll get to the analysis that we've done for Lehigh. A lot of most of the city doesn't meet that, not just speed limit, but design-wise. <laughs> right. Yeah. But we've got to start somewhere. And, and the point is we have to benchmark and really work on improving and really looking to the, the high areas of the highest risk potential. So if you've got a street that's, let's say, 25 miles per hour is kind of your 85th percentile, 85th percentile speed, um, that's kind of what uh, FHWA would consider the operating speed. But you have a strode with 45 mile hour speed limit and cars going 50 on uh, average basis. 
Um, that one's going to have a whole lot more risk potential, so that should be the priority in treatments. Uh, it's not to say you shouldn't work on the other ones, but it really, when you do your systematic analysis, understanding what the safe speeds are, analyzing all your roads, the types of users, types of conflict points, and that will kind of establish uh, what that's going to look like for your city. Yeah. And I'm really glad that you included this graph here, too, because this really brings to light the the power of like when you look at the Dutch approach to, um, you know, their their residential streets and the feet struts and you realize, oh, yeah, these are all 30 kilometer per hour zones when you have shared space there. And when you translate that to miles per hour, you're like, oh, yeah, that's like 17 miles per hour. And it all starts to make sense that, oh, yeah, if you're going to be mixing people in automobiles with people walking and people riding bikes, people in wheelchairs, if there is that unfortunate collision that takes place, that crash that takes place, you know, if you're traveling less than 20 miles per hour, the, the, the great likelihood of surviving it and uh, it, it is going to be much greater there. And so speed is so incredibly important. But what I like to also emphasize too on this is that it's also the crash avoided. Because yep. once you're go once you're going at these speeds, you're going closer to human speed. And we see that in, in some of our busy intersections and, and junctions with people on bikes, and you realize, oh, look at the hundreds and hundreds of interactions that are happening. And because they're all traveling, you know, at 15 miles per hour or less typically. It's like you, you, you can have all these little movements that happen and these are all collisions that never occur because the speeds are closer to human speed. Yeah, and that's the whole point of the slow speed forgiveness. If you're going 20 miles per hour, oftentimes you can stop before you even hit somebody. Exactly. Which is critical, especially with yeah. like a, somebody walking. You no, know, it's always best to not hit somebody walking or biking. If you hit a car your car going slow speed, you're going to probably be okay for the most part. But, and and yeah, what I love cool. about that is that it, it also doesn't show up on any of these graphs because it's the, it's the yeah. collision that was completely avoided. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So uh, moving on, we've, we've, we've got uh, uh, this little video here uh, and you just recently posted this because this kind yeah. of got, got you worked up a little bit. I call this my research. I purposely drove through this traffic in my car just to show, you know, traffic's not as bad as it seems to be. But while I was doing that, I see cars driving in the bike lane. I was like, come on, guys, what is this? This goes back to the whole idea of humans make mistakes. You know, this time on purpose, they're like, well, my time is more important than yours. So I'm going to speed around you on the bike lane and get to where I'm going. Uh, but that's why it's so important to look at your design, especially on your, you know, main road networks. If it's anything beyond kind of residential street, you should probably have your bike lanes separated. So in this case, that curb should be right up to where the white stripe is and the bike lane on the backside next to the sidewalk. So if you have that design feature, that now starts to restrict the types of mistakes people want to make. Um, so now you're not driving in a space that's uh, really intended for bikes, but obviously not too many people cycle there because it's not a very comfortable place to be for. Yeah, would reason. you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> no. I, you know, I, I, I might, you know, as, as somebody being relatively confident and brave, uh, doing that, but I wouldn't recommend somebody who is interested yet yeah. concerned. Yeah, I mean, definitely. Yeah, I mean, now what's the speed limit on this on this particular uh, road? Strode. Go Strode. Yeah, <laughs> it's trying to be a freeway, but it's actually the frontage roads of a future freeway system, kind of like what Texas does anyway. But uh, it's forty miles per hour here, but it goes up to I believe fifty miles per hour afterwards. So having that kind of speed with a bike lane like that. Uh, Basically, when you get into that kind of speed, that bike lanes are clear area. Yeah. When you're looking let's go. Let's design. go. You said 40 miles per hour and you look at this and you're just like, uh-huh. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's <laughs> nuts. That's nuts. Yep. When we when we look at this type of, of situation, too, in, in, in the Dutch have a pretty standard sort of approach at this. When they when they look at a, a, a road like this, it's more than likely going to be a 50 kilometer per hour, um, you know, motor vehicle speed roadway and they're sort of their dividing line of anything above you know basically above 30 kilometers per hour you need protected and separated infrastructure for people on bikes and people walking 
And so uh, this would definitely be to your point. It should be a, uh, yeah, have that curb right up to the edge here. And then, you know, you have a grade separation and you have probably the the people, you know, a facility, maybe it's a super, super wide multi-use path, or maybe it's a separate uh, pedestrian path next to a, a cycle path. So, yeah. And I think there's a big, there's kind of a distinction too, between a speed limit and what people actually drive. So even if you were to just set the speed limit on that road to 20 miles per hour, which obviously wouldn't fly, <laughs> uh, but uh, if you were to set that for 20 miles per hour, you're not going to get people going 20 miles per hour because it feels like a freeway basically because it's got big wide lanes and shoulders and all that. So the design needs to support the speed limit. So you shouldn't have to have speed limit signs to make people understand how fast you should be generally going. Um, so that's that part's so important. Yeah. Well, now we're getting into some of the analysis. So this is the analysis uh, comparisons. Uh, walk us through this series of uh, images. I'm not sure if they're in order or not, but we'll slide through them and, and, and yeah. we'll, we'll be surprised by what ha- comes up. Yeah. And I will admit that these are preliminary and this is what I've been working on for Lehigh. Honestly, I still need to you know, share a lot more with our staff and things here. So, but I, I like to get the idea out there for other people to considering there might be some refinement to this process, of course, but get people thinking about what does it really take to do a systematic analysis of a city. Uh, so this image here, in fact, uh, uh, I think some of these have titles on the images. I'm trying to remember. I should have put titles on the picture. Oh yeah. So this one is the uh, access management uh, comparison. Oh, okay. So on this image here, what this is showing is one thing that also is mentioned in the sustainable safety standards that's not so much in the FHWA's guidance is uh, functionality of the roads. And that's so important to get right. And there's going to be a couple elements of that that we need to look at. This is what I call kind of your strotometer map, maybe. <laughs> so if the, if the colors, there's kind of a baseline under there and then a smaller line with different colors in the middle. Um, so the baseline establishes the functionality and the, the color line in the middle is how many accesses per mile there are. So it's showing here's how much permeability you have on that road. So do you have, you know, for example, kind of on the right hand side, there's a red line all the way up through there. So it serves a through function for roads. Uh, but you have a lot of the yellow and sometimes even a little bit of green color. So you have a lot of access. So that by definition is not a great strode. Uh, that one is just a one lane in each direction strode, but but you have a, the, the access is incompatible with the function of the road. So sometimes when you're looking at the analysis, then you have to almost uh, take a step back and think, all right, what, what would we do moving forward here? And honestly, I don't know the answer yet on this one. That's for our city staff to talk about. But um, should this be a through function for road? Does it make sense for a through function here? If so, then let's look at the management of accesses along this and really try and get a design that's safe, limit those conflict points. It also helps with the efficiency of your road because I would much rather have an efficient road with one lane each direction than a less efficient strode with two lanes in each direction. Now you have a whole host of safety issues and uh, opportunity costs to the use of space because maybe you could have had a protected bike lane, but now instead you have all these vehicle lanes. So it's really important to look at functionality for that point of view, but really decide what should the function be here. Once you decide what the function should be, then you look at the design, the access spacing, things like that. So, Got it. So this right here kind of looks at the context of the roadways. So when you have uh, a through function of your road, just like how to, they took it around it, um, you don't want to put the through function right through the heart of your city because uh, then you have this incompatible context with a through function. Then you're going to have all this access along your road, creates all these conflict points, and it really just creates a lot of safety issues too. So, for example, here, this this really kind of gets at the transects. So I try to map out the city um, in terms of you know land use transects. So obviously green is kind of your natural areas. The purple is kind of more of a city center. The Pink is what they would call a general urban transect. So really looking at here's the transect is kind of your context. And this map shows what your functionality of your roads are. So when you get a a red line going through pink or purple areas, then that's where you know there's going to be issues, not just with livability and quality of life, because that's obviously something that I really want to improve for the city, but gets that safety too, because you have a, you know, like a urban center with a lot of land uses, that's going to create a lot of demand for being able just to walk places, even cross the street and you put a five lane road through the center of that. Because we know humans make mistakes, 
uh, if you can call it that, you know, obviously the term jaywalking has definitely made that uh, try to be a thing. <laughs> but we know people are going to want to cross this thing. And if you're going to make someone go a half mile out of their way to cross the street, they're going to cross it in a different location that's not intended. So it creates huge safety issues when you have this type of context around a through function of a road. So that's really what this is getting after. So that kind of back to that whole circulation plan issue. You have to look at the functionality of your roads and where they're going relating to either the existing context or the future context of what you want a place to be. Yeah. So this one, this map's just showing whether the, and this is just speed limit alone, so this doesn't address design. I've got different layers in my analysis on that, but this just says, does the speed limit, posted speed limit, meet the safe speed or not? So we have the, the chart from FHWA and the chart from Sustainable Safety, and they tend to match up pretty well. So this kind of shows us where the the posted speeds match the the safe speed or not. So obviously you can tell we've got some work to do. The freeways that have grade separated interchanges and then the small little HOA streets in some of our communities out west are the ones that tend to meet it. Meet it. Interesting. Fascinating. And then this one here is just to map out just the number of lanes that the roads are. So you can see, you know, the yellow ones are kind of your three lanes kind of looks at the functionality a little bit, but uh, if you have multi-lane roads, obviously that's gonna create more uh, issues for safety. So uh, you wanna just kind of gives you a general idea of what you're looking at the city, kind of around that north part of the city, you can see a lot more of those multi-lane roads. So there's gonna be a lot more issues there. So that's when you have to take a step back again and look, is this the right type of road for the context? Um, if this road makes sense to be here, then how do we overcome the safety concerns, you know, so build a great separated bridge for trail, for example. So that's going to be uh, what you look at for, for your type of roadways there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see it pretty clearly in some of these. Okay, so one of the elements of safe systems is all safe users. So if it has a trail or protected bike lane, I put a color and some of the colors are whether it's on half of the road or both sides of the road, or if it's a small enough road, you know, a trail one side is going to be okay. Um, so this is just kind of looking at, do we have all safe users all over the city uh, for the, you know, in this case, this is for bikes. So there's some areas of the city where you do have some facilities, but there's a lot, a lot of uh, parts of the city that don't, which obviously, which is part of that glass ceiling to our success in the amount of people cycling. Uh, if you don't have a safe place to ride, people are just aren't going to want to do it. So uh, this really kind of gets after uh, a bit of that. Fantastic. And uh, walk us through the, the definition of uh, each of the different colors. Yeah. So green uh, just means, yes, there's a, if it's a smaller two lane road, if you have a trail on one side, I've put it as green. Uh, obviously everybody can. Uh, the bright green, but... not the dark green, right? Yeah. Yeah. The bright green. Yep. The dark green are just little local streets, which can be shared. Um, the bright green is when, uh, yeah, there's a safe facility on there. If it's a five lane road, for example, and you have a trail on both sides, then it's bright green. Uh, the yellow means that half of the road has a safe facility, but it's a big road. So you're not going to reasonably cross it, go down and cross it again to get to a destination on the same side. Uh, so that in those cases, I'll note it as half. And then the orange lines mean only part of the segment has a piece of a trail, but then it just dead ends at a certain point. So kind of see where that is a little bit there. And then the red is... That just means there's no facility on any we've, segment we've, of the road. We've missed <laughs> the mark. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. So, and then this one um, is the sidewalks analysis. Yep. Same thing for sidewalks. And again, uh, green means it's on both sides. Uh, orange means it's part. Yellow means half of it. And red means no sidewalks. Now, some of them, like there's that big red line across the top. That's a major highway. Probably shouldn't have sidewalks anyway. So uh, we're going to want to find a disentangled uh, place to, to take people in that section. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Get, get people on a, a completely separated facility. And what's the population of, of Lehigh? Yeah, it's about, I think we're in the low 80,000 range now. Okay. So it's anticipated a build out to be about 160,000 or so people. Okay. So, but that could change. <laughs> this map here is showing how far off the speed is. And again, it's just posted speed, not the operational speed. I'm still mapping some of that out. Um, this is just showing here's the posted speed. How far off is it from the safe speed? So this kind of gives you an idea of 
where your highest risk potential is at. So when you're prioritizing improvements for safety, this is kind of what you're going to get at. So if it's uh, you know a, a dark color green on dark color green, it's not as big of an issue. Uh, but like some of these, you have uh, you know orange over green, so then your risk potential is getting higher. So it's almost a bit of a heat map to say here's where your highest risk potential is based on the types of conflicts and the types of users that are there. And here we've got uh, the analysis speed off. Yeah, so this is just by itself. This is just showing how far off the speeds are, similar to that other map, uh, but just doesn't have it overlaid, so it kind of stand out a little bit more. And this one includes all of the local streets uh, as well. So, well, interesting. So on these these local streets, uh, when you're saying speed is off, that this means it's on these local streets, people really are going faster than they should be. Well, and per our posted speed limit, a lot of our streets, the speed is actually pretty close to it. Okay. Uh, but it's looking at the safe speed. So the safe speed is 20 miles per hour on a residential street. Right. And the speed limit is 25. Um, sometimes the speeds get a little higher than that, even if it's a long straight section. But but overall, we're, you know, five miles per hour more than what the safe speed is recommended. Now, in terms of risk potential, that's obviously a lot less risk potential compared to the strode with, uh, you know, 45 mile an hour speeds. So, right. you know, in the grand scheme of prioritization, that's going to, obviously be a little bit lower than some of our more high speed type roadways. And is 25 miles per hour, the uh, sort of the default uh, residential kind of speed on, on these quiet little streets? Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty common, at least here in Utah, I'm assuming other places in the United States as well. Salt Lake city uh, reduced their uh, default speed to 20 miles per hour. Uh, so that definitely sets, sets a good precedence for the rest of us. <laughs> uh, I'd like to get to that at some point. Obviously, lowering the speed limit would be great. Now, enforcing it, it's going to be a little different. So that's going to, you're going to have to. Well, I mean, and that's where you start to look at, okay, what can we do from a design perspective of, you know, of being able to bring those speeds down? Um, but, you know, taking that step, you know, that acknowledgement of if it's 25 miles per hour in these areas, and especially if we also see that it's an area where there aren't a lot of sidewalks provided or there's no bike lanes provided on these streets, they're de facto shared streets. And so having that baseline uh, speed limit set at 25 and then if it feels safe to drive faster than that, they drivers will drive faster than that. And then we just see that exponential increase in the potential for serious injury and fatality rates going up. And so, you know, I, I applaud those cities that are taking the move to bring that, you know, that baseline speed down to 20 miles per hour. Then let's get working on the traffic calming and, you know, traffic diversion and those types of things to bring, be able to encourage and support the slower speeds. Yeah, absolutely. And and in some cases, it goes beyond speeds. Now, this is just looking at safe speeds, uh, safe systems approach. Obviously, goals for a city go beyond safety, but safety should, in my opinion, be a baseline. But uh, obviously, there's use of space. You know, if you have local streets, you know, even if your speeds are managed, but uh, they're wide and a you know, driver feels entitled to the space, you know, get out of my way. You know, it's just kind of more of the use of space, you know, so there's some different elements like that you can get into as well with the design, of course. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So earlier I, I had mentioned a little bit about, you know, the, the interested yet concerned. This is a similar type of, uh, you know, graphic that, you know, really you know, makes that differentiation that not everybody's comfortable riding in an unprotected uh, bike lane. Uh, talk about the relevance of this in the work that you're doing. Yeah. So what we're really trying to target is, you know, when we're, you know, building out our bike and pedestrian network, we really want to target those interested and concerned folks because um, that's where you're going to see most of your success. That's where the, the greatest majority of people fall into this category. So uh, if you plan just for the highly confident, you know, your success is going to be pretty limited and your goals of, you know, uh, reducing traffic, air quality, you know, traffic congestion, all that kind of stuff. You're not going to see much success in any of those um, if you're just going on that. Now, by focusing on interested and concerned, you're not precluding or uh, not allowing highly confident people to use it as well. And that's uh, what's so important to get right in your design is making it work for all of this. But if you generally design for the interested and con concerned, you can uh, make it work for everybody. 
Yeah, it's really important to um, you know, acknowledge the fact that you know, for those who are highly confident, uh, you know, even like expert and yet vocal riders, yeah, we get that this you know separated pathway may not be you know something that you feel is is you know for you or necessarily something you need. We got it. It's we're not building this for you. <laughs> we know that you're confident riding on the road go for it. <laughs> so, well, and, and sometimes when maybe as an example, looking at the design of a path, for example, so if you're a confident rider, you're going to get going fast, but oftentimes we'll see in the U S you know, you have uh, a trail, but they have a lot of those ADA ramps bumping up and down. So you have to go down to street level. So when you have that, it causes you to slow down. It, it kind of affects that whole comfort principle. So even when there is a trail, sometimes, you know, you'll see the confident riders in the road, but if you both, address the safety and the comfort issue by doing, you know, the continuous style crossing where the bike path just goes across and the cars bump up and over. Then you also make it more comfortable for those riders to use it. You're not using the ramps all the time. And especially if you separate pedestrians out onto a separate sidewalk in those busy areas, um, then you can really start to accommodate all users. Um, and instead of putting investment in space out into the street, your street narrows, which again, slow speeds makes the street safer and crossing it. But then you also have a better and more usable, bike path and pedestrian experience over there. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good, good point. I'm glad you clarified that as well. So we've got a, a, a variety of, and this is kind of an example, like we were talking about yeah. earlier. <laughs> yeah. So the crossings here are continuous and this is an example of slow speed forgiveness, right? The driver didn't see me going. I honestly didn't see the driver at first until the last second when he's cause he kind of cut over and didn't use a signal. Um, and the last second, it seemed like he just came out, but, he was able to stop pretty quick before he got up there because the design forced him to slow down before he went up and over. That is exactly what I was talking about earlier of you have the slower speeds, the lower speeds of the motor vehicle, and you, you, you know, end up having an interaction, which is a non-event. In other words, it was a near miss, but it was a, not a collision. And, you know, it, it's like one of those self-reinforcing things. The more that we can encourage the slower speeds and, uh, you know, we, we can actually have these and th actually every time that one of these kinds of happen, you know, it, it's a self-reinforcing learning process as well. Cause I'm sure the next time that person's driving and comes to this very same thing, they're going to be like, Oh yeah, the last time I was there, Mike was there. I wonder if Mike's going to be here again. <laughs> Yep, that Mike guy. Come on, <laughs> that Mike guy. <laughs> so the, uh, on this one here, we, we've uh, we're, we're taking a look at uh, the planned uh, Thanksgiving uh, urban plan. Uh, walk us through what's going on here. Yeah, so this is kind of getting at uh, land use. So when you're creating a successful bike network and getting more people out walking, you have to really look at land use, which obviously there's a lot of information out there about suburban sprawl and how that really kind of requires people to drive so we're really trying to look at land use as well here in lehigh so this is an example of a new urban center it's not perfect but i think it's come along pretty well considering uh, we've got uh, instead of a parking lot of the transit station you can come off and there's a plaza and there's buildings retail space and a direct uh, bike path that comes through this what we really want to try and look at is bringing destinations closer to people because then it makes again it's the whole convenience factor if you can hop on your bike and it's, you know, a mile away to get to a place like this, to get to the grocery store, restaurants, or even work, then you're a lot more likely to utilize that mode of transportation. And every little step you make in that with both the land use and the cycle network means that's one step less of, you know, this runaway sprawl that's, that tends to happen in a lot of American cities. Yeah. I see some really interesting stuff here. Uh, we've got uh, up here uh, to the top, we've got a future uh, transit-oriented development there. We've got the Front Runner Station. Again, is this one of the, the rail uh, lines with the station, or is that a bus? No, this is a, a commuter rail line. So this connects uh, all the way to the north to Ogden and down to Provo and all points in between. So, And then we also see over to the far um, upper right-hand side, we've got the Interstate 15. So we also see that this is sort of sandwiched in between that rail line and then the interstate uh, highway that is you know, kind of cutting through here. Yeah, yeah, and a big piece of the design that we worked with the landowners on the thing here is really focusing on directing people over to that rail station. 
obviously the freeways there and that'll provide your vehicular access, uh, but really focusing on that, that rail station and the active transportation network that's going to be developed around this. Now the challenge here is we do have a five lane existing strode here, which may evolve hopefully over time to something that's a little slower. And Yeah. Yeah. It's, and those are, those are obviously very, very challenging. Uh, you know, just, uh, up the road from you, obviously in Salt Lake city, uh, Salt Lake city is notorious for incredibly wide rights of way, uh, which date back, you know, to the original platting of, of the city itself. Uh, but yeah, I mean, dealing with those incredibly wide rights of way that you have there and then trying to reimagine them in, in a creative way. So I always like to say, you know, when we do have these, you know, massive strodes, I mean, yes, they're, they're a problem to be dealt with, but in some ways it's a blessing to have that real estate because then you can, you know, with the political will to make some changes, you can reimagine what that looks like. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what I've loved to see, like, you know, cool single in Rotterdam and the way they reinvent reimagine that yeah and speaking of like reimagining how how you, you, again when you have the rights of way you can get some creativity and do some stuff like this yeah yeah so this here is an example of a uh, kind of a road design we've been working on and and again i'll say from the advocate point of view uh, planner working within a city you know obviously i'm advocating in fact it's my director that has this uh, kind of analogy but he's like sometimes when you're working with people if you just yell at them and calm down or whatever, you know, they just shut down. They're not going to listen to you. So people that I work with, they're good people. They want to do the right thing. Uh, have they learned a lot of this stuff that I have? Maybe not, but uh, we kind of have to share and help them along the way and see, you know, if this is something they can get on board with. So, so it's kind of like the, the analogy is it's like taffy. Uh, you have to kind of slowly stretch it out and, and then it'll get going. But once you get going, you can pull it pretty quick and it'll stay intact. But you try to do it real quick, sometimes you just break it and then things shut down. So, But this is an example of a roadway by going through this process and, and talking with other staff and with the, the, the developer of this. This is part of a transit-oriented area on the north end of our town. You know, we've got a roadway, just one lane each direction. Um, in hindsight, it should have been a maybe one-way bike lane on both sides of the road, but we, we have a two-way bike cycle track on the one side. Tried to get red asphalt on it, but it's, it's going to end up being black. But uh, oh, got to keep trying. <laughs> But uh, so we have this design. So instead of doing a typical, you know, you got 50 feet of asphalt and you just stripe it all. Now we've got, uh, you know, safe places for cyclists to cross the street to get into the cycle track area. Got some on-street parking and you've just given the cars essentially the space they need to operate within the roadway. In other places, we have continuous type crossings that are going to be on the bike path. And as you can see on the other side, the sidewalk doesn't cross down the street level, it kind of ramps up to the sidewalk over there too. And we have added uh, pedestrian crossing here as well. So it's not just uh, bikes that can cross the street. Oh, okay. So yeah, that's, yeah, I was going to ask about that. It looks like, it, it looks like it's only a crossing for, for bikes that on, on the left-hand side, but yeah, so you, it, it is going to be for both. Yep. Yep. There'll be a separate crosswalk there that also go through that median. So you have that refuge, you have just one lane across in each direction. So this is where the roadway design is so critical to get right, because if you design the road and the five lane, just big swath of asphalt, then it's going to be super difficult to, to cross this and get over to where the transit station is or the future commercial area. But creating roads that calm the cars down, just give them the space that's necessary and you give uh, opportunities to take the street crossing in two stages to see that, uh, you know, everybody else uh, kind of bought into the, the concept and we're trying it out. So that's kind of the thing is sometimes you have to uh, get what you can on the ground and let people react to it and see what can you learn from it. If they like it. Obviously, they're going to be a lot more open to doing things in other places of the city. So uh, it's really it's really important to uh, get whether, you know, especially for me working for a city, but even for advocates, if you can just get something on the ground. This is a kind of a permanent design, so it was really exciting to see them agree and, and go forward with this type of a design. But in other parts of town, in fact, that's one of our other images. We've got uh, more of a paint and reflector post uh, type separated cycle track, but it's kind of a proof of concept type of issue. So, yeah, we'll take a, we'll we'll take a look at that in in just a moment. Um, since this is more of a permanent design, a couple of quick questions uh, on this. Did you say that this uh, where the crossing is here is uh, the the bikes and peds will go down to the road level, or will this be a continuous elevated platform here? Yeah, so that's part of kind of the negotiations we go through. So we didn't uh, get the raised crossing that we would hope for. So you do have to come to the road level. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
And hence, uh, it looks like prioritization is given to the motor vehicles, given the direction of the shark teeth there. Yep. And, but that to me is a lot easier to come back and change in the future than the entire roadway. So sure. sometimes you have to take what you can get and get it on the ground. And then, uh, you know, you can improve things in the future as well. What's the motor vehicle travel lane width here? Um, so these ones, and that's again, another thing that we're always yeah. working on, but yeah, yeah. these are, I believe 11 foot lanes on this okay. one. Okay. Obviously, so they're not, they're like, not massively wide. I mean, you know, it's, it's not like the 12 to 14 foot lane. So it, hopefully encouraging a slower speed and what's the what's the speed limit on this on this road um so it's not built yet so it hasn't been established but i would imagine 25 well that, that's an interesting thing, way that you phrase that <laughs> what is your desired uh you know speed you know for for this given the context that it's in is this you know hopefully you're going to be you know, and this is one of the things I push back on with with transportation planners, and, and it not it is don't don't say oh we haven't done the measurements yet. No 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 no. What do you want the speed to be given the context and the fact that you're going to have uh, people crossing here? Yeah, this is where I have to clarify. I'm giving my opinions, not the. I know, the <laughs> I know exactly. <laughs> As I say this, I'm not speaking yeah. on behalf of my employer. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> No, I, I think it needs to be 20, given the context uh, and safe systems approach, because we've got a crossing point here and not just here. You may have people crossing the roadway without a crosswalk, just in the median at other locations. Got it. Uh, so we need to make sure that if someone runs out in front of a car or something, you know, the speed is such that it's going to be uh, a lot safer and, and the person most likely going to be OK. So what's the land use context around here? Is this uh, like a park area or, or is there a lot of uh, uh, things happening? Yeah, so it's developing. There's some existing kind of single family homes to the east of this, the right hand side of the image. There's a new apartment and townhome complex going right to the right there. So you got about 400 housing units right there. On um, the left hand side, there's would be future commercial mixed use type development. And then the uh, future, what they've now said, which should be a, a light rail station. Um, and then a lot more land use farther west of the rail station down there with uh, mixed use development. So definitely that uh, more urban type of a context. So that's why I, th I do think, especially given that case. Yeah. You know, and what's the name of this one? Um, so the, the development's called Vistas at the Point. Um, I don't know if there's much out there at the moment other than what's on our city files, but, but uh, yeah, they call it the Vistas. Very, very interesting. So we've got some other interesting um, sort of land use things here that we're going to take a look at. We've got this particular development, the SALT development plan. And a lot of these are just some examples we just want to show, like there was that Thanksgiving point example that, you know, that's going to be a larger urban center, but throughout the town, and this has kind of been working with our council, uh, but uh, they've, in our last uh, master plan update, they've now identified these transit-oriented development areas, but not just for the sake of supporting transit. Obviously, we want to see that, but we want to see land use centers that provide destinations close to where people live. Even if you live in a single family home, you can have closer access to a place like this to walk a bike to. Uh, but obviously, increase in the quality of life and, and being able to enjoy the city. And these are examples of putting new housing in our downtown. That last image was uh, mixed use development on our main street. So you've got retail, office and housing all within that same building. So we're taking steps uh, with the land use plan as well and trying to really create uh, destinations closer to where people are um, and trying to create places that have vibrancy and uh, a sense of place for people and uh, a gathering areas uh, for the community. So a lot of that's really important to, to having a happy, healthy community. And 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 those images are, are really rich and, you know, it, it brings a smile to my face. And I know that, as you're mentioning, it, a lot of it is just still kind of like not quite there yet. But you're, you you have these visions, you have, and hence planning, you're, you're working on the planning. <laughs> yep. Uh, yep. And, and so, yeah, here, here's like an image of, of you know, kind of, the situation that's out there now. So this is another thing, again, it wasn't standardized or anything like that, but we we're working with our other staff and the picture is kind of ugly because it's snowy and there's big ugly power lines there. But this is one of the, the main shared use paths on the west side of our town. Um, this is a, a roadway, one lane each direction. It has buffered bike lanes. I wish we would have got them separated behind the curb from the start. But, um, but crossing this roadway, what we've done here is eliminated left turn movements from the streets uh, on either side of it. So you're reducing the complexity a little bit so that uh, there's fewer conflict points of people crossing the path here. 
uh, but also makes it very direct if you want to go say to, there's a big huge park just behind the picture here uh, so if you want to get to that park it's now more direct to use this path than it is to drive because you have to kind of go back and around because of the limitation there and this is just up the street or up the trail i should say up from that last image we've been working with the, the developers of the area to front housing towards this. It's kind of a power corridor, but it'll be kind of a park greenway going along this. So really trying to get eyes on the, the trail, create a more engaging space. But uh, one thing we've done here as well, we actually have street connectivity standards for our city that we don't want cul-de-sacs everywhere. We want a more connected network of streets for walkability, but we want to look at defining that even further, kind of with the whole Houghton example. Um, and so in a lot of cases, make it, just as or more connected for cycling and walking and maybe a little less connected in some cases uh, locally for cars. Um, so for these shorter trips, you're really incentivizing um, using the trails and other things, but it doesn't preclude obviously the option of being able to drive somewhere. But in this example, there should have been a street here, but we uh, had changed things in our code to say, look, if it's a kind of our main trail route, punch the trail through and let's maybe not take the street through it. So. And, and I really think that this is actually you know, an example of getting the best of both worlds because there is still an affinity towards a housing development, you know, a cul-de-sac sort of development and, and not having, you know, feeling like you've got, a, you know, a car is constantly going, you know, through your neighborhood or right outside your front door. So, I mean, cul-de-sacs are actually very, very desirable for many, many home buyers. But what I love is when you can penetrate those cul-de-sacs with walking and biking pathways that then connect to a trail network like this, then you start to realize, oh, we can really have kind of the best of both worlds on that. And as long as the, there's, you know, richness in terms of land use and you've got mixed use developments and, and meaningful destinations within close proximity, you can really start to see a, a community, you know, being able to kind of fire on all cylinders to use a terrible car enthusiast, uh, you know, terminology. Uh, but you know what I mean is, is like you're, you're able to, you know, really lean into this off street network of pathways and connecting people to meaningful destinations, uh, including their homes. Yeah. And I love the idea of people want a cul-de-sac because there's low traffic and what does traffic do for people? It's a safety issue. It's a noise issue. It's not the typical cul-de-sac, but now you have to get and use these arterial roads for all of your travel, but it's kind of taking that whole benefit of what people like, but combining it with just everything you just said, connect connectivity to trails like this, land uses, all that kind of stuff. Now you're kind of, and that's really kind of part of the Dutch approach to, to doing planning. Yeah, um, is combining those those two principles there. Well, and that's a, a big part of Olu, Finland, as well. Is it's a very yeah. suburban context, but they have an entire network of uh, bike and pedestrian pathways, which you know enables and allows for an extraordinary um, you know modal share of of kids getting to school. You know, somewhere in upwards of 70 percent of the kids are are getting to school by biking, even in the dead of winter. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> and I will say a lot of what I uh, present here as well is of a suburban context. Obviously, there's a lot you can do urban, but uh, I think there's a lot you can even do in the sub suburbs like this that can really increase quality of life and promote active mobility. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And what's really nice, you know, you know, from my perspective is. Uh, when you are in communities like Daybreak and also Lehigh uh, that are continuing to grow and continuing to attract people moving into, into the area, if you can then work with those developers to have these plans in place and thinking about active mobility connectivity and leaning into the the network of off street network of of active mobility pathways it just really opens things up and i think in the case of daybreak you really notice and you see maybe the same thing here in lehigh uh you really see that it it is attached to a perceived quality of life enhancement. People really are like attracted to it and saying, oh my gosh, this is so great. I, you know, I, I can park the car and I don't have to get back into it, you know, until I need to do that trip, which is going to be a car dependent type of trip. Everything else I can do by jumping on the bike and, you know, getting around town. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's been cool to see the progression in Lehigh because not a, the, the city takes on many forms because it's pretty big geographically. So it's like that area was kind of a master plan community, but you have other areas that are kind of older development areas. But 
it is cool to see the progression over time and and uh, how many more people are starting to get out and do that. Yeah, that's a good segue to this right here. So this shows where our kind of trail network is at, so our off-street kind of network. Obviously, you can't get it, you know, think of the cohesion principle. You can't get from anywhere to everywhere comfortably on a bike, and a lot of these do cross major roads at grade. Some of them do have quite a bit of grade separation as well. Can I say one thing, though, is I, I don't think that... I don't think we have to like assume that you can't get anywhere because yeah. these are, this is the, 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 the network of, of pathways. And yes, it's not a, a complete cohesive network. However, if, if you happen to be living, you know, like say, you know, right here in, in the middle, uh, you know, and, you know, and you need to be able to get to, uh, you know, that, that trail network, but you happen to be living on a quiet residential street, that that's easy to bike on and, you know, ultimately doesn't have a lot of flow through traffic, et cetera, cut through traffic. It can be quite comfortable. So one of the things that I always try to lean into and, and try to encourage people to think about when they see bicycle networks and pathway networks is, is also overlay what, where there, there is comfortable streets that you can, where there's virtually no infrastructure per se, but is, is very, because as you, you know, because you've been to the, the Netherlands, 60 to 70% of the entire uh, Dutch network is shared space. Yeah. And so yeah, that right. brings us, that brings us right back to what are our shared street situations? So those residential streets, have we been able to bring that motor vehicle speed down to closer to 20 miles per hour? And then magically you just open up all sorts of cohesiveness and connectivity to an entire system. Yeah, absolutely. And that was uh, one of the reasons we were pushing for our connectivity standards in the first place as well. So you can have that. So a lot of times you're forced to have to go out to major roadways and there are some areas of Lehigh that are that way too. Yeah. But yeah, if you can get places without F ever having to deal with that, then that definitely changes. Yeah. 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 I, I hear you. Okay. And then, you know, and that's kind of, I think that's, one of the, the comments that you have on this is looks like more like a, a roadway network or is this, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just kind of show, you know, the difference of where the networks are at, but I totally agree on the local street network. That definitely is a huge part of the active trans transportation network. Yeah. I like to show here's our primary networks. You know, this is the last one is our primary kind of off street bike network. This is the primary car network. You can obviously see how well the car network is connected at this point compared to the bike network. So, Kind of just shows us, you know, why there's, you know, limitations on, you know, the number of people who choose to use bikes. Because uh, some people who are comfortable, they, they will get out on the residential streets and ride. But even then, I've seen some people uncomfortable to ride in the street. They'll go on the sidewalk even on a residential street. So there's a lot of perception, I think, that people don't like. They just want to get on a trail on their bike. So I, I do think there's a lot of outreach that needs to be done. Like, hey, look, these are... All these other routes that we can do, perhaps something that we can build into the plan. And uh, it'll it'll state the obvious uh, here is that also on you know uh, those slower streets, those residential streets, basically cars are allowed pretty much everywhere. Yeah. And so even <laughs> though it's not highlighted in in orange on 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 screen here, yeah, pretty much all of those little tiny little squiggly streets that there, pretty much cars are allowed everywhere where you see one of those little lines. Yep, yep, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Okay, Mike, we uh, we need to wrap this up, <laughs> but we have some really cool uh, SketchUp models and videos, video clips. So I'm gonna press play and uh, let you talk through these. Yeah, so I, I love to use modeling to kind of visualize what things could be. So that kind of shows how you take your typical street design you see with high speed forgiveness here in the United States and do something with a little bit more of slow speed forgiveness and uh, kind of still have all the same elements within the street design. It's not to say this is, you know, one size fits all design. Every road and streets can be different. But in this particular case, you know, there's no on street parking, got bike lanes, sidewalks, and a travel lane in each direction. So this just shows how you there's that paradigm shift from the way we do things now over towards the safe systems. So you can see how you can separate people. It's actually less infrastructure. So if you're building a brand new, it's actually cheaper than the last option too. So that's just kind of thinking about things in a different way. And I'm always trying to use drawings like this to advocate for a different way of, of doing things, but maintaining the same elements at its root anyway. So. I love it. And, and we do see that we have a, a much, much safer crossing here. We've, 
we, that is a continuous level uh, for people on bikes or somebody uh, walking across in this area. So that's great. So this kind of shows us, yeah, it's a bit of a progression of a trail crossing. So you go from typical to one with uh, chokers on it to a more continuous type uh, raised trail crossing. And that line shows how you can still accommodate fire truck turn movements because you make the flared approach wider. So uh, a lot of times as a planner and even as advocates, when you're proposing something, you almost have to think through all these pieces of what you may get response. You know, if I'm proposing something, it's like, well, how's the fire truck going to get down there? So if you can show, you know, look, you can still maintain the same turn radius. You just have to do it uh, at a safe speed, but it makes it more comfortable and safer for the person on that bike. So, so that last one was what used to be the, the standard for Lehigh. The middle one with the chokers is the current. We're looking at something like this, at least on private streets and private accesses at this point. But again, you kind of have to take baby steps in the way. I guess not always. If you have the political will, then you could certainly jump to the, the ideal situation. But if you don't, then sometimes you have to take baby steps and stretch that taffy and get people comfortable with new ideas. So. How often are you dealing with private streets? Well, so we've got quite a bit in some of our planned communities and, and things, uh, especially out on our west side of town. So there, there's quite a few private streets. Um, this right here shows kind of more of a temporary situation. If you want to make some improvements without a lot of budget, you can redo uh, your street space. This is actually from one of my YouTube videos that I did just to show like if you can just change your striping and put some reflector posts, it's not the ideal protection, but in the short term, this could uh, be the next step towards a more permanent solution. Uh, and a two-way bike lane is not always going to be the ideal situation given every context, but it just shows how you can uh, reuse that space. The cars will slow down because you have more of that friction on the sides with uh, not having that space there. So this here is just to show, uh, again, visualizing here's a major roadway. Putting a trail on it does give you a place that's separated to ride, but it doesn't totally uh, address all the safety issues. You really have to look at the road design as well. So that's kind of what this, again, not to say it should be one lane each direction, but again, it's ideal to minimize the number of lanes where you have pedestrians and, and uh, people riding bikes uh, involved. Uh, and again, continuous crossings really look at the, the big picture. The roadway design has such a, a profound effect on the safety of, of people um, even driving, you know, that truck pulls out in front of that car right there. And that car's going 50 miles per hour. Those drivers are also at a high risk of uh, injury fatality. Have you had any transformations like this? Not at this point in the city. We're, we're getting some of the more temporary transformations, like the one with uh, showing the kind of parking protected style bike lane. So we do have uh, some of that coming online. Uh, so again, taking steps, uh, different directions, seeing what people think about it and hopefully building more support for more permanent solutions as we move forward. Yeah. And what's, what's interesting too is in, in, in I, I kind of predicted that the answer was no, we haven't had any uh, transformations of these, but this is one of the most dangerous types of roadway designs that we have, a five lane uh, road. You've got that center turn, continuous center turn lane there. It, it's almost as dangerous as the, you know, the, 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 the dreaded four lane road where, you know, they're just absolutely horrific when you look at the number of, of, casualties and serious injuries and fatalities on that. And we're talking, I'm literally talking about motor vehicle crashes and motor vehicle uh, lives lost, motor vehicle driver lives lost. These are some of the most dangerous designs that you can have just because it encourages incredibly high speeds. And so what's really interesting about this type of design and when you start working with communities and being having communities be open to this is maybe it's maybe this street was what was on the drawing board and, you know, originally, and they're saying, well, no, you know, we don't need to do that. And we shouldn't do that because the context is such that the, the number of lives lost and serious injuries is completely unacceptable. We need to rethink what this corridor looks like and turn it into something more like this. And that's also where the whole functionality idea comes into it too. Sometimes you have to have so many lanes because you have so many access points and tur turn signals, all this kind of stuff. So if you can look at the functionality and the way your road is being used, perhaps you can be more efficient on fewer lanes. So, yeah, yeah. so this is just to show how I've even uh, worked with other advocates to look at different solutions. This is an Ephraim, Utah. It's a little uh, college town, snow college here. Uh, but they have a state road that comes through here that really s splits the town up. So we actually presented to their mayor and said, hey, look, there are some different options uh, you could look at. Uh, this first slide here shows you know, the traffic volumes really aren't 
anywhere near such that you actually need four lanes. Uh, one lane in each direction would more than handle the amount of traffic they're seeing. So a step in the, in the right direction would be something like this, where you get uh, safer crossings, a separated bike lane space, visually narrow the street. Um, all these features coming on play to both make it a better place to, to go to. The ideal situation would probably be a car-free street, considering you have all the businesses and this is the heart of the town. You know, that main function should actually go around this rather than through it. But if for some reason you can't get the support because this is a state road to, to move that function somewhere else, then, you know, you can at least try and slow people down and uh, create a little bit more of a people-oriented place in center. I would say that that would be like a step too far. It is a state highway <laughs> road and you do have businesses right along here that would be like freaking out that, you know, they yeah. don't have, you know, motor vehicle drivers don't have the, the same level of access that they had before. But this is speaking to the what I was just talking about. This is one of the most dangerous roadway designs that you can have, a four lane road. And so the design that you guys came up with is, is absolutely brilliant in my mind. You're bringing trees into that space. You're preserving motor vehicle car parking spots, which is going to make the, the businesses really super comfortable with the fact that, you know, a, a person can still get there and you're maintaining, you know, viable access, you know, through this area for motor vehicle traffic. Uh, and so again, really kind of the best of all worlds. You, again, you're bringing green back into the space, you're bringing livelihood to it. It's much more accessible from a walking and biking perspective. And ultimately, it's also going to be a much more pleasant environment for those businesses there because people will want to be there. It's no longer a four lane highway through the middle of their downtown. Really? Yeah, and I will clarify, I will clarify on that one that uh, they're, they're doing a study on it. So we just uh, presented that as an idea, not to say that it was exactly what they're doing, but like, hey, this is the kind of stuff we're trying to, you know, just like you said, trying to get the best of both worlds, step in the right direction. Here's what we should be looking at. Well, well for that town, folks, if you're watching this video, <laughs> do it. That's, that's pretty darn brilliant. And uh, that's just, you know, taking this from, you know, my quick little analysis of looking at it and uh, and looking at it from the reality of just how disastrous four lane roads are and how much they encourage speeding and they really do kill small towns. They really do kill businesses. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. Before I let you go, Mike, I absolutely have to uh, give you a little love on your YouTube channel. So yeah. talk a little bit about uh, your YouTube channel. What are you trying to achieve yeah. with this? Yeah. So I, I don't know. I'm a very passionate guy. So I'm like, I just, you know, obviously I have a lot of influence with my job, but I just want to spread the word uh, in a way. It's kind of like how I can organize my thoughts as well. So I like to get the, the word out there. I really like to make things visual. And uh, so I decided to start this YouTube channel and, and get that out there. But uh, I really love to, to do to do this work, I just have, you know, my, my dog obviously takes priority, especially my family. I've got a son with special needs, so it takes a lot of time. So I don't, I'm not uh, super frequent on when I can get stuff out, but I'm always working on a project. So right now I'm really working on the videos for the safe systems approach. And I'm even uh, working on some kind of music videos. So redoing some uh, songs and putting it to more of a planner. I think one of them I'm working on is called Strobe Busters. So nice, <laughs> so nice. Popular. Hopefully that'll be entertaining and, and make a point as well. So, Fantastic. Well, I, I, I definitely wanted to give you some love on, on your, your channel here and uh, encourage, hey, everybody, you know, make sure you pop on over to uh, Mike's channel here, Bike Quest with Mike West. And uh, I, I have to you know, comment on the fact that your most watched video of all time was from two years ago where, you, where it's titled, I Hate Traffic. <laughs> <laughs> it's the truth. I hate traffic too, just like everyone else. But it's how you deal with it is the important part. So, but yeah, this one makes some people gravitate to that. Mike, this has been such a pleasure having you on and so much fun. Um, I've really been enjoying all the work that you've been doing and you and I have been trying to connect uh, for some time to uh, to meet up in person. So that will happen at some point. I owe you yes. a visit to your area and I look forward to hosting you here in Austin one of these days. And I just want to say sincerely, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for having me here. It's, it's an honor. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Mike West. And if you did, please, hey, give it a thumbs up 
leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. And also be sure to subscribe to Mike's channel, Bike West with Mike West. And if you're enjoying this content, please consider supporting my efforts out on Patreon, buy me a coffee, YouTube, sync, super thanks, right? <laughs> as well as buying things from the Active Town store. Uh, I've got some really good stuff out there, including yeah, streets for people, coffee mugs, t-shirts, all sorts of good stuff. Uh, every little bit adds up and helps out a great deal in keeping this channel moving forward. And again, thank you so much for tuning in today. It really means so much to me. Uh, and until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.